good morning. Nope, it's not. <laughs> um, I think that's like the third time I've said that on a Wednesday. I am so sorry. Good evening, church. So good to see you all tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and stand and uh, let's go ahead and worship.
So, um, just so you know, again, we're going to be making a trip to Mexico. If anybody's interested in helping us or maybe going down there, get with us. We'll let you know the details. Um, just so thankful that um, we get to stay active and busy and being his hands and feet. Uh, even, in these, even in the days that we live in, you know, the, there's still needs out there. They're still hurting. They're still poor. And... Um, God continues to give us opportunities. I think today somebody, did we get 20 turkeys? Is that what we got? We got 10 turkeys. Um, you know, we got donated 10 turkeys. So just continue to just be, be blessed and uh, be able to, I think to, it, we have some sausages. Maybe if somebody wants some sausages tonight, we have some bratwurst. We'll give you a package of bratwurst. Uh, 
God just continues to just overwhelm us and overflood us, and I'm thankful to be a part of all that he's doing. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Sound like my brother's here. <laughs> uh, 1 Samuel 14, you know, we've been watching... Um, We've been watching Saul develop his kingdom and watch how he's doing it in an incorrect way. And it's, and it's very sad to see a man have the ability and opportunity to be a vessel of the Lord in his hands and to take it and to become self-absorbed with it. And I think that's what we're going to learn about Saul. Is Saul is self-absorbed. He's a prideful man. He doesn't know how to um, be humbled. He wants to save face for himself constantly. He wants to, and we're going to see to the point where his, he, he's willing to put his own son to death to save face. And that's a very tragic. I think that we see that a lot in some families that uh, parents put their own selves in front of their needs of their own kids. And, um, man, that can be a tough thing. So the good thing, though, is, Samuel, uh, Saul has a son named Jonathan, and Jonathan is the perfect Christian, man. And uh, not only is he the perfect Christian, but he is the perfect son, because he knows what the prophecies were to his father. He also knows the, the book of the law. He knows what God's plan is for the Jewish people. He knows that he's a member of the circumcised tribe. He knows that he's a part of the family of God. He knows that his family carries all the great promises and he's willing to step out of the boat and go and try to accomplish what God has said that he could accomplish instead of trying to reason with himself or even what we're going to see with Saul gets overly spiritual about it instead of just doing something just oh well let's pray and fast about it and instead of just going and doing something so let's just pick up where where Jonathan um went and um Let's just read it again. I'm just read it. We're going to start from verse 13. Hey, you know what? I don't think I got my clicker. And before we get started, I just want to say to all the veterans in here, thank you for your service. I know we have several men in here that have served, and we appreciate your service and all that you've done for us. Especially some of you have sons and daughters. 1 Samuel chapter 14. So we're going to look at this battle that's taking place, and it's a real battle. It's a real life battle. There's real, there's real lives. There's real strategy. There's real weapons. It's real. But here's the thing on the other side of all that is God, who is supernatural, more than real, is, on the, is involved in the same battle. But all that the people can see is the things that are real, the, the reality of life, which is all the armor, all the men that, that, that it says like the sand of the seashore just spread out everywhere. So all that blue would be the Philistines. And so the Philistines are in the territory, and they're all over the place, and they're scattered, and they're equipped, and they're men of war. And Jonathan already goes and starts one battle that actually brings the Philistines to the front lines to come battle. And then Jonathan is just, he's ready to continue on this battle. He's ready to continue fighting forward. And Saul is just waiting to hear from the Lord. Jonathan is already moving. I, and I, you know, in, in, all, in all honesty, I remember when I became a Christian and my eyes got opened up, whenever somebody told me anything related to the Lord, I believed it. I believed it. I mean, I remember praying over uh, dryers that went out. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, I know that you can heal this dryer and you can bring life back to this dryer, Lord. And, and I remember praying, and dryers would come back on. But then you get older. You have a good job. Your dryer goes out. Hey, can you send me another one over here? <laughs> but let me tell you, it's that simple faith to just believe that God's going to turn the dryer on. That's the, let me say, that's the kind of faith God's looking for. He's not looking for us to reason, well, should I pray over the dryer? I got money. I'll just buy the dryer. I'm not saying it's about a dryer. But what I'm saying is about it's the principle of life, of learning to trust the Lord in all things more than you trust your bank account or your ability or your position in, any, in life. You trust the Lord. Jonathan, he didn't ask for this position. He happened to be the son of the king. 
He knew that God said that I'm going to use you to go after my enemies and defeat my enemies and, and move the Philistines back. He's, that's what he said, and that's what he believed. Saul's the one that's sitting back, and so we're going to pick up. I'm just going to go ahead and read in verse 13 of chapter 14. And Jonathan climbed on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and he came after him, and, and he came after him, and his armor bearer killed him. Then the that the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men with about a half acre land. I want to show you one, one time, one more time, what that possibly looked like. Those cliffs and those rocks are the kind of rocks that Jonathan had to climb up to get to these men. He, it, these, it wasn't just a trail. It was actually scaling up rocks to go to this place. Imagine the courage that he had to have in his heart to know that God was with him as he was scaling that wall when the men were on the top of that the hill, of the hill, not the wall, the the, the cliff, the cleft. And um, this is the terrain that he had to, to maneuver through. I mean, these were this was a real man that had to just overcome the obstacles that were right in front of him as the day goes on. And listen, sometimes life just it just, is, it just comes at you, and you still have to maintain who you are as a Christian and your promises and God's faithfulness to you in the most mundane, simplest of lives. You, we just have to understand that we are children of the promise. We are Christians. He is for us. He's not here to beat us up. He's not here for us to lose. He's here to teach us, to train us, to help whip us in shape so that we're ready for heaven because that's all this is, is training ground for heaven. It's just, training, it's just training us to know who he is before we get there. To learn all the different aspects of how we can learn to trust God in our life. Going across a border, having children. Those are all things that takes courage to do and to, to be a part of. I mean, and so Jonathan is just showing this, just, this, this tenacity. And you know what? You know what? The secret to my success is, if I have any success, if I have any secrets, I don't, but it's trusting God every day for provision and for the next step and for the next level. That's all this is. It's just one day just chasing him every day. When I got saved, I, I, like I said, I believe everything they told me. Everything they told me, I believed it. And then as time went on, I had to learn to settle some of that down and to pull some of that back because maybe I was a little over aggressive with some of that. And I matured, but let me. But honestly, I'm still chasing opportunities to minister because that's what He's called us to do. You know, the best way to let somebody know that Jesus loves them is to show them how much you love them. And then you can introduce them to Jesus. Because if they ain't liking you, you're not the one. It's okay. So they killed all these men. And there was trembling in the camp, verse 15. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrisons and the raiders also trembled. And the earthquake, notice this. Not only did they tremble when they heard this slaughter going on, because in this valley, you can hear. Not only did they hear the, the, the battle going on and the screams of the, the, the soldiers, but then all of a sudden an earthquake shows up. God jumps in the battle. He doesn't always jump in the battle like this, but he always tells us that he's in the battle. He just may not jump in the way we think he's going to jump in, but this time he shook the grounds. And it said the land began to, to, to quake so that it was a very great trembling. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away. So he's sitting in his place, and he can see out over the valley, and he can see all those people. All of a sudden, he just starts seeing movement. And the men fading away from him, going back, not knowing what's taking place. Jonathan is in the middle of it. Jonathan is trusting and believing everything that God told him was true. He's in the middle of it. Saul is over here going, like, what do I do? What do I do? And it says, now, the, now Saul said to the people who were with him, now call the roll and see who has gone from among. He, he, first thing he wants to know is, <laughs> who's not here? Who's, who's out there fighting the battle? Because you know what I guarantee he's thinking? Who's going to try to get credit for it? 
because the first battle that Jonathan did, it said Saul won that battle. So he, we, we heard him get the credit. It's going to be, and it's interesting because I wondered, I always wonder why Jonathan was so quick to jump on David's side and why Jonathan was so quick to be a friend of David. Jonathan knew that he, his dad was the king and his dad was the worst king. I guarantee you, he's going to, and we're going to see that there's something going on between him and his dad. It said, then Saul said to the people who were with him, now call on the roll and Suez has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to <laughs> that guy, and bring the ark of God here, for at that time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest. At the, so he's over there trying to get all spiritual and get all these things in line before he goes to battle. And the, they're already fleeing. He's already winning. He ain't done nothing. And he's still waiting. Now it happened. While Saul talked to the priest that the noise was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So they kept getting louder and the screams getting louder. And he's going, where's the ark? Where's the stuff at? And then he finally goes, you know what? Never mind. Withdraw your hand. Never mind. Let's just go. Sometimes I guarantee you, you want to know when you're supposed to step out, go do something, make a move and do one of those things. And you're ready. You're ready. I've known guys. From my past that mentioned way back 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that God called them to be a pastor. And here it is 20-something years later, 10 years later, and they're still not doing it. I don't know. I don't necessarily think that that's not because God didn't want them to do it. But, if, but here's what I've, I've learned about my life. If I'm going to say something about my life and I believe that God would be in it, then I'm going to believe it through. And I remember saying... I'm going to start a church. I believe God's with me, and I'm going to do this. And I just, I believe that God will, he'll bring the people, he'll bring the money, and he'll bring everything. I, all I can do is get up and follow my passion. And you know what? He has more times than I can even count. He has come through and just proven his, as I believed, he responded. As I trusted he just backed up his word. That's all he does. All he does is honor his word through your faith. Jonathan is a guy that has faith. He has faith. He, he, just, he just has faith. He knows that God's in it. You know, when we came back to church and we were having to worry about masks and the pandemic, you know, I just, I got to the point where I go, you know, Lord, we got to do it. We just got to push through. And Three plus months now, we've been meeting back together, and God has been faithful to us, and God has been, he's honored us, not because we've been reckless faith, not because we throw that out there in a reckless way, but we understand, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. He tells us that. He says that we need fellowship. And so, I mean, I mean there's, there, there's, there's something to be said to a deadly disease. There is something to be said about a pestilence, but there's also promises against a pestilence to his people. There's also promises that we can hang on to and go, you know what, Lord, I'm not being reckless. But I'm going to trust that this scripture is going to wash me and cover me. And, and you know what? I'm not knocking on wood or nothing because I believe that God's faith will carry me through. I don't have to knock on wood. <laughs> I'm just playing. That wasn't a real... That wasn't a real knock. That wasn't a real knock. All right. Here we go. Moreover, it said, Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. Indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor. They're, they're, they're killing each other, the, the Philistines. God is so much into this battle that they're killing each other. And this ain't the first time God's turned his enemies on each other. Let me tell you something. Our enemies will turn on themselves too. Our enemies that hate the church, our enemies that the, 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 the Satan is controlling, the Lord says that the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And so if the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one, when the wicked one tries to come after the church, it will not prevail. He will not prevail against the church. He'll come against the church. We'll feel the sting of him coming against the church. We will feel the uncomfortableness of him coming against the church. And we will not like the way he comes at the church, but he will not prevail against the church. His promises have told us, that, and so we as his people need to know 
that when the enemy comes in like a flood, he's going to hold a standard against them. But one of the things that we're going to watch is the enemy destroy itself. Just watch. You just watch. It said, um, because there was very great confusion, because that's what the Lord does. He just, he's, the Lord allows Satan to just be who he is, the author of confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, probably, you know, slaves of, of, of previous raids against the Israelites, these guys jumped ship who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country. They also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the sissies, all the men of Israel who were hidden in the mountains in Ephraim, when they heard the Philistines fled, they also followed after them into the battle. So Jonathan's faith stirred up everybody else's faith. See, that's what we want to do. We want to be the person. We want to be the individual. We want to be the one that stirs other people's faith up. Your life has the power and the ability by your choices and your actions and the way you live your life to stir other people's faith up. That's the encouraging thing is when your faith inspires somebody else's faith. And let me tell you something. There's been many times, many times that others have inspired me and built my faith up. Things you have done, things that others have done, have inspired me and, and built my faith up when sometimes my faith gets down too. I was telling somebody the other day when me and Patricia uh, moved back and started Calvary Chapel, you know, that first two or three years was really difficult when there was just a couple of my family members coming and six or seven. And, and it was frustrating thinking maybe, maybe I'm not meant to pastor. Maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to do. And maybe I'm supposed to just stick with the tile business. And my wife said, honey, you said, that's what she told me, you said the Lord told you to start the church, and that's what you're supposed to do. And I go, you know what, you're right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it, I, you're exact, I'm going to keep doing it, but, you, but, she, but she inspired me, you know, and, and, and that's what we want to do with each other, we want to inspire each other's faith. Listen, God's plan and purpose is, is way more than you can even imagine, way more than you can even imagine, way, way more than I can teach it. Way more than I even understand it to teach it. But some of the things that I do know, what I do know is he loves us. And he is a good, good father. He is a good, good father. He's not a bad father. He's not a drunk father. He's not an addicted father. He's a good father. We can learn good things from him. Saul, on the other hand, we cannot. We cannot. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening. Now, what king of, a, of an army would say that to his people? Not only that, but he doesn't have a, the ability to put a curse on anybody. His power and his position gave him, the, 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 in his mind, gave him the ability or, to think that he could do those kind of things. He's a bad, bad leader. A bad leader. You don't do that. You, look, anybody that knows if you're trucking and you're on trails and you're doing all that, you need, you need bites to eat. You need to keep your, 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 your potassium up. You need to keep your salt up. You need to keep your energy up. You need protein. You need all those things. You don't make your people fast in the middle of a war because it sounds spiritual. I remember, I remember when... Uh, our, our building on 4th Street when we were on Franklin in a little shopping center. And uh, the man offered us to rent this building over there. And I'd already seen it. And my cousin called me up and go, hey, uh, the owner called me up and wanted to know if you want to rent that building. I go, yes, absolutely. And he goes, well, well, don't you want to pray about it? I go, man, he might rent it to somebody else. We spend time praying about it, man. Tell him, yeah, we'll take it. I'm always in prayer. I'm always in prayer. I'm always praying, Lord, guide me and lead me. And when I recognize that, I went, ooh, that's an answer already. And you know what? And, and the Lord, it's not, I'm just telling you, it sounds radical sometimes, but it's not. You just know. You just know. Jonathan knew to go and attack that garrison. If he would have told anybody, they would go, ooh, that's stupid. That's stupid. But listen, how many of us as Christians Choices we've made to follow Christ if somebody labeled as us stupid. I've been called stupid a lot. One, for going to church so much. 
You go to church too much. That's, you, that's stupid. Spend all your time at church, man. This is the best place to be right here. You know, we ain't the we ain't the prettiest people, and we ain't the cleanest people, but we're the best people. We're the best, the absolute best. I love this messy crew, this messy church. Yeah, so, and so here we go. Curses the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. And they're not even his enemies. They're the Lord's enemies. So no one, no one of the people tasted food. Now all the people of the land came to the forest and there was honey on the ground. Now, now notice this description that the Lord puts in here. There was honey on the ground. How often do you see honey on the ground? You don't usually see it. So the Lord put it there. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. This is the first commercial ever. Can you imagine like a dripping cheeseburger, a dripping anything, just dripping? You're like, oh, man. This honey's dripping. Taste me. Look at me as it's dripping. Look how sweet I look and how sweet I. Because that's probably the sweetest thing that that was their candy and their and nutrient because it had nutrients in it. Um, but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore, he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand, and he dipped it in the honeycomb, put his hands to his mouth, and his countenance brightened. As soon as he got that mouth full of honey, he just went, whoa, yeah. I do that with a Dr. Pepper, with a chocolate donut, with chocolate milk, chicken fried steak, a cheeseburger, french fries. <laughs> My, my counter changes too. My counter's going to change about 7.30 tonight. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. But Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. He might not should have said that, but it was true. Jonathan is out there on the front lines kicking butt for his father. Not necessarily for his father, although his father's going to get the credit because he's the king. Jonathan was doing it because that's what the Lord commanded him to do. Not because the king said to do it, but because the Lord said to do it. The Lord is the king of kings anyway. And the Lord said to do these things. I'm going to use this king to drive out the enemy, the Philistines. Jonathan is more concerned about doing what God has called him to do than trying to have a relationship with the Lord at that moment or make a sacrifice. Because remember, he's going to tell Saul in a minute to obey is better than sacrifice. Jonathan is out there living his walk, living his faith, living it, living it. it, it, it just I mean, risking his life, putting it all on the line for his faith, for his trust in the Lord. He shouldn't have said it, but he said it. But Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look, now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? He said, we'd have been able to do much more. Because notice that even though supernaturally the Lord gave them a victory, the Lord still left in their hands to do their, to, to do their part of the victory. There's still responsibility in our part. You know, God does his part, we do our part. He does the greater part, we do the little part. We just got to do a little part. But that little part is required. And as we do our part, he'll do the big part. Any of you, any of you have a wrecked life? If you have a wrecked life, if you will make right choices, being obedient, following the Lord, he will hook your life back up. He's a good, good father. Now, they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. Ajalon. So the people were very faint. And the people rushed on the spoil because by that, that evening, now they can eat. So now, now notice what they do. And the people rushed on the spoil, took sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood. You know why they did that? Because I'm, I'm a pit master, I'm going to tell you why they did that. Because when you cook meat, it takes time to cook meat. You can't, it, you, you got to kill it, drain the blood, and then 
cook it, and it takes a few hours. You got to get the fire. You got to get. It's a process. It's four or five hours. These guys have been not eating all day. They're starving. They're not waiting for. It. They're eating it raw. They're, they're 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 probably cutting it up. This is where some of you rednecks get that. I'll take it. <laughs> right off the right off the cow, two quicks on the grill, and then you eat it. That's against the law in Jewish custom. That's what they were doing. They couldn't. They they. And it's funny because they were, they were scared to break Saul's law, but they broke the Lord's law just like it wasn't nothing. Because a lot of times we're more scared of man's laws than the holy law. We, we, we obey a holy law. We don't get the opportunity to just be submissive to man. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Then the people told, then they told Saul, saying, Look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. So he said, You have dealt treacherously. Roll a large stone to me this day. Then Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep. Slaughter them here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So he said, Made everybody come to him to do it, to make sure they did it right. So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first altar that he built to the Lord. So he's, he did something right um, here. Now Saul said, let us go down to the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. Then the priest said, let us draw near to God here. So Saul asked counsel of God. So here, 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 here he goes again. We never see Jonathan asking the Lord because the Lord already said. And you usually chase your enemy and once you, once you got your enemy on your back, you go after him. Unless the Lord specifically says not to. When you get your enemy on your heel in those days, you plundered him. You finished the job. Saul is asking for the Lord to, to tell him what to do. That Uman and Thurman, they believe that's what he was using. How that works, we're not sure. Like two dice, a yes or no questions is what, what they took. And it apparently worked. So he said, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. Apparently there was a, a silence in the rolling of the, the dice or whatever that was. And, and the Lord would not answer. And Saul said, come over, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. So now he, he, he's just going to. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. So he just kind of throws this out there and says, we're going to find out who has sin. And if it happens to be my own son, he'll die. He just throws that out there. But not a man among the people answered him. So nobody said nothing. Then he said to all Israel, you be on one side and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. So him and Jonathan stood right here. People are on that side. They're going to roll the dice and see if it points to them in that crowd or these two right here. And it says, uh, then he said to all Israel, you be on one side. My son Jonathan will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. Therefore, Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. So Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. So now I must die? What a question to have to ask your father. But because Saul would rather save face, try to look like the king and try to look like the man and not be embarrassed and humble himself. You know, a man that won't humble himself is the worst kind of man. A man that can't be trusted because if he won't humble himself, it's because of pride. And pride is the sin of the devil, man. That's, a, that's the toughest thing for me is I, I'm, I'm constantly wanting to just stay clean and open. But I've had to learn over the years that you also got to be careful who you clean and open to, who you share with. 
But one thing I've always known is that I can never hide myself from the Lord. And if I can't hide myself from the Lord, then I just need to be honest at least with the people around me. And they hold me accountable. And I pray my kids respect me all the days of my life. Unlike we're going to see Jonathan and, and Saul, this relationship. So now it seems like no wonder when Jonathan sees David show up on the scene. Jonathan knew that God, through Samuel, told his father that he was going to raise up another man. Jonathan heard that and knew that. And so when he sees David, he sees all that David's accomplished, he goes, that's the guy. I'm going to support him. I'm going to encourage him. I'm not going to try to hang on to the throne. That throne belonged to Jonathan. Only if God gave it to him. God never gave it to Jonathan. He gave it to Saul. Saul lost it. It said, uh, Saul answered, God do so more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Man, he's still going to follow through with it. That's how hard this guy was. That's how prideful he was. But check this out. But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall on the ground. Fall to the ground. For he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and he did not die. The people stood up and said, the king ain't doing this deed. It's funny, they were all scared of him to eat. But when they saw what he was about to do to Jonathan, they had found motivation and, and inspiration and encouraged through Jonathan. And you know what? We don't want to, we, we, we want to discover that in, in, in you as well and try to build that up in you. Your courage, your, your tenacity to, to still let the Lord use you. You can be 80 years old and be used. Did I point at you? I didn't, I didn't I wasn't trying to point at you there. Brother, I'm just saying, hey, Moses got started at, at, at 80. You know, I'm, I'm so impressed and I'm so humbled by so many retiring to Waco and not retiring. And I, I appreciate all that the, 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 the you men have done that have moved here. And, 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 and I mean, even Jason jumping in, the Pollard, I mean, even the pains just, you know, it's just uh, incredible to see. You know, my brother, he, Carl put a, a, a library, a lending library in his yard, Christian books in it. Just, just wanted to bless the neighborhood. Just, just to make, be something refreshing on the corner. He lives on a corner. It's a perfect place for it. It's just, it was beautiful. It looked like a little church people. Look, there's all kind of ways to let your light shine. There's all kind of ways. We don't all have to climb a scale the rocks. <laughs> Kill 20 soldiers to be used of the Lord. Some of us move the cords around, clean the clean the, the, the stage off, you know, just so to be simpler and smoother. Just to be a blessing. It don't take much to be a blessing. Wipe a toilet seat down. You know, it, it don't take much. And I'm thankful that it don't take much. But look, let's finish reading this up, reading this out. It's crazy, man. But the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And that's what I think is so important that we understand, that God likes to work with us. It just, he just likes to do it with us and be a part of it. So he rescued Jonathan. So the people rescued Jonathan. He did not die. Then Saul returned. Notice this. Then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines. He just turned around and went home. Instead of following the Philistines like he originally said, he just turned around and the Philistines and, went, and they all went to their own place. So Saul, is, then, then God's going to give us a little overview here. So Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side. That's the grace of the Lord allowing Saul to continue to be the king for a while. And he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. The sons of Saul were Jonathan and Jeshui and Mephibosheth. That's who it's going to be later. No, not, Mephibosheth's not 
not in here, but um, um, yeah. And the names of his two daughters were there. The names of the first was Merab, and the name of the younger Michael. Uh, we'll see. We'll see them later. It's funny because when uh, when David marries Michael, Saul says, "Yeah, we'll give we'll give uh, we'll give David Michael, and she'll trip him up." <laughs> so he already knew his daughter was a was something else. The name of Saul's wife was Hinoam, the daughter of Amaz, and the name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now there was fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any young man or valiant man, he took him for himself. So the Lord is just showing that Saul had a strong, he brought his family in to make his you know, his staff, his chief of staff, his security, his personnel. And he just started with those around him. And, you know, that's all we can do when we go to battle is just make sure we have friends of support. You know, I may not be a part of your ministry, but I can still support your ministry. You know, I may not hit the streets and go knock on doors, but, you know, I'll buy the pamphlets that you pass out. You know, I'll do my part. And so we can all have a part in even with other people's ministry. I just want to show you a couple of things real quick. I, I, I want us to just... Always remember that whenever you're facing a trial, whatever it is, whatever it is, you know that you are a child of the king. You know that you are a child of the king, and with that comes all the promises and all the privileges. All the promises and all the privileges. Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us. This is when the, the spies spied out the land and saw the giants in the land. It freaked them out, and they did not want to go in there. It says, uh, the Lord hates us. And, and this is what you have to be careful of, too, when you go through your trials, is to think that your trial is punishment, that God hates you when it's too big for you and it looks like it's going to overwhelm you to think that God hates you and he's not for you. He is for you. He is for you. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. He held nothing back from you. And you know what? If you've walked with him any amount of time, you've experienced his goodness. You've tasted it. You know it. You know it. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. That's what they were saying. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. I can't stand it when brethren do that to each other. Saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakin there. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he's always around the corner, man. He's always in front of us. He can see what's around the corner. He will fight for you. You have to lay it at his feet and trust him there. And then once you go, you know what? Sometimes you just go, Lord, I'm just going to worship you because I know it's going to come to pass. I'm going to trust you, Lord. And then you just allow the peace of the, who God is to just assure you that it's going to be all right. You're going to be okay. It's not going to be as bad as you think it is. It never is unless you add to it. Unless you add to it in your flesh. He will fight for you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria nor before all the multitude that is with him. Your enemy is going to be greater and stronger and more powerful than you physically. For well, there are more with us than with him. With him, listen to this, with him is an arm of flesh. An arm of flesh pushes buttons, bombs, pulls triggers. That's what an arm of flesh can do. An arm of flesh can do all that. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Listen to that. And to fight our battles. Sometimes he makes you stand at the battlefield and watch, though. Sometimes he makes you stand and watch the hardship of what that battle looks like, of what you're going through. And sometimes there's residual. 
in that. But if we're his, we're going to come out victorious. We're going to win. God's not going to let you go. You have to you have to do your part. March according to his beat. March according to his ways. Listen to his orders. Listen for his voice. His spirit. And he will guide you. He fights our battles. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name for this day. And Father, I, I thank you so much for allowing us these opportunities to just study your word. And I, I don't know how you use me sometimes, Lord. I feel like I'm so lost at times. But I'm so thankful, Lord, that your word still seems to just penetrate our hearts. And for that, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so thankful, Lord. Lord, I pray you continue to provide for us. Give us the courage in the days ahead, Lord God, to stand taller and stronger for you. And Father, we just thank you. And Lord, I thank you for giving me 26 years with the love of my life, Lord. And I look forward to all that you have for us in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Tomorrow's my anniversary. Yes, yes, David. There's a difference. There's a difference between ham and turkey. Turkey.